Right, everybody good this morning? Fantastic. So we just had finance feedback. Um, and a number of people have kind of been asking me, uh, what, what is tithing, what is um, giving, what is you know, an offering, what does that look like? And those are good questions because we live in a world where for some of us, it's a foreign concept not to know. We, we, we were raised in schools, I'm giving my age away, but we were raised in schools where the Bible was taught, where things were addressed and questions were asked, where, where kids went to nursery, to primary school or, uh, and um, also came to kids' church on a Sunday, and that was kind of the norm. But we're living in a world where people don't know the Bible anymore. People don't know the, the principles. People don't know, you know, what is, what is tithing? What is, what is an offering? And God has been laying on my heart for some time now, this sermon. But giving it in a way that is a biblical understanding of what it means to give. What it means to have an offering to give to God. Not just for the sake of it, but actually explaining it. And I believe that even if you are here today and somebody that's walked in church for a long time, that there is something that can change in our perspective and our purpose for giving. And we need to be reminded of that. If you are joining us for the first time this morning, welcome. You, like Deline said, you chose that Sunday. However, be assured that this is not a prosperity doctrine and a prosperity message but one of the values that we actually hold fast to here at Hope Bridge, that we will be a people who live lives of generosity. It is, it's actually, just to put it into context, in five, the five and a half years, so you picked that Sunday, but the five and a half years that Deline and I have been here, I have never been led to preach directly on giving. Not once have I stood in this pulpit and directly the message be about giving. So in five and a half years of us being here, if you knew today, you picked that Sunday. So the objective for today is the biblical understanding and perspective of giving. God's purpose and intention of giving offerings to the church. And everyone who calls this place home, what does that look like for you? And what is the spiritual consequences of that? If this is the place where you are spiritually fed and nourished, if this is your house, what does an offering look like? So with that said, just to say that, first time in five and a half years, let's turn to Exodus 4. Well, we'll be reading from verse 1. And just to give you a little bit of context here while you're getting there, it's the second book in the Bible. You look up the chapter 4, and you're reading from verse 1. Moses is in a conversation here with God. In fact, he's in a bit of a wrestle with God. And this conversation is actually around God's desire and Moses' will, or lack thereof, within himself and his own identity, as well as what he has to offer. So picking up in verse 1, Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord is not, is, is not appearing to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff? So this thing? And we'll get to this just now. A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake. And he ran from it. 
Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if, you do not, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, then may they believe the second. But if they do not believe those two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent. Comes up with more excuses. Neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant, which is like five minutes ago. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not the Lord, I the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send somebody else. Funny, eh? Then the Lord's anger burnt against Moses and he said, What about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you because I know you. Okay? Craze ad lib. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you and it will be as if he were your mouth and as, as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if they see any of them are still alive. Jethro said, Go, and I wish you well. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons, put them on the donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. Thanks be to God for his word. Now what we have been sharing since the beginning of the year, from the vision that God placed, I'm going to put this, this looks awkward. I'll get back to this now. From the vision that God gave us, right through the forecasting faith series to last week where we spoke about the practices. So Delina and I shared some of the practices that, that remind us but also hold us as a community. Is that God will use all things, every circumstance, every occurrence to bring about His redemptive plan for humanity. His objective, primary objective, is His kingdom here on earth. And he invites us to join him in that kingdom story. And the grace of God is that he brings about transformation in us. He changes us from the inside out into the likeness of his son. Not as a command, but as an intimate relationship of trust. So here in this passage, God begins to do a work of transformo transformation in Moses by building a relationship of trust God gets a little frustrated with Moses here but it's all centered about a relationship between him and Moses for a kingdom cause this is what I need you to do Moses but I want to build that relationship of trust with you Moses was reluctant And he receives God, it's God's grace, receives these three miracles from God that Moses is to perform 
in front of the Egyptians. But we're going to look and we're going to hone in this morning specifically on the importance of the question posed to Moses by God and the staff as the answer to that question. The staff was in Moses' hand and what it represented in Moses' transformational story. So the question that was posed to Moses was, what is that in your hand? And how God chooses to use what is, Moses's, what is in Moses' hand to transform his understanding and his perspective of his very life. And how his life, God is calling into the redemptive story of a nation. Now in order for you and me to get, to get a full understanding of this journey and this moment that Moses is having here with God, we need to understand the purpose of the staff. So I'm going to take this back. And I feel like I need a, a volunteer. Why am I looking this way? But to get the perspective on what the importance of the staff for a shepherd. It was a tool of his livelihood. Do we grab that? It was the tool for his life. The staff was the, used to protect and secu the security of the sheep, to, fall, to ward off wolves, to wall, ward off snakes, to ward off whatever it is that was coming for the sheep. It was his protection for himself as well out in the wilderness. It was also for guiding and directing those naughty sheep that needed a good get back in line. Anybody here? A naughty sheep that I need? No. But for guiding and directing the sheep. For getting the sheep out of a hole. For getting the sheep back in line. For protecting the sheep even if they didn't feel they need protecting. This was the weapon that was so critical for the task of his livelihood. That staff represented his identity as a shepherd, as well as his livelihood. So for Moses, that staff in his hand that God was addressing was an absolute trust thing for God, uh, for Moses. It was his survival. The thing we needed to prove, uh, he needed to prove he was a, sh was a shepherd was that staff in his hand. The thing that he provided for his family. His protection, his comfort, his provision. It was all wrapped up in the representation of that staff. It was his paycheck. What is it that is in your hand? What is that thing in your hand? I'll tell you the first thing about it. And Moses needed to learn this first lesson. And maybe we do too. Is what is in your hand is not what defines you. Should I say that again? What is in your hand is not what defines you. It is not what gives you identity. Moses throwing that stick on the ground. What seems just like a stick. Was a huge step of trust for Moses. Because what he needed to learn, the first step he needed to learn, if you look at the entirety of the passage, he's having this debate with God. Send somebody else. I'm not the right guy. The, the first thing God addresses is his identity. Moses, that stick in your hand, you are not a shepherd. Throw it on the ground. I will show you where your identity lies. Verse 3, it says that. Throw it on the ground. What is that in your hand? Is what God has given you to advance his kingdom more important and the thing that defines your life.
Is it the thing that rules? You will not trust God. Hear me on this. You will not trust God with your life if you do not right size your resources. That is the essence of giving. That is the essence of being generous. That is the essence of what generosity does. Is it right sizes the scales in your heart. It allows you to begin to trust God by laying it down, submitting it, submitting the things that we sometimes think are more important. It says, the authority of God is more important to me than even my very life. So that when God, and if God says, pick that snake up by the tail, you've right-sized the snake and the staff. That snake will not become greed, and it will not control you. It will not bite you. But you will be available to be used by God because your identity and trust are in God and God alone. The second lesson that Moses had to learn and we have to learn when it comes to this thing called giving is what is in your hand God uses to tr transform your perspective. Change your perspective. Moses began the journey of transformation in this moment of this passage. What he had in his hand mattered and it was significant to God. Did God need it? <laughs> no, he's God. God doesn't need our resources, but he understands the value of what we do with our resources for us, for us not for him. What is that in your hand, Moses? It's a staff. That's what I kind of think Moses said. A staff. And I can kind of think him saying, I can see what that is in my hand. Almost, God, that's a bit of a silly question. But how is this staff, this stick in my hand, going to change the nation? It's insignificant in terms of the scale of what is required. How is this stick going to change an entire nation's perspective? And that is one of the lessons we need to learn. It's not about how much. It's not about what's in our hand. It's making it available to be used by God. No matter how small or big, it matters to God because God teaches us through it. Never ever think or come to the point where your offering doesn't matter. It's insignificant. It, it's just such a small thing. It's about making it available to God. Because He asks us what's in our hand. Just remember, God can use two fish and five loaves of a willing heart to feed over 5,000 people. It's not the item. It's not the item. It's the willing heart behind the item. Moses' perspective needed to change beyond the staff or the stick that he had in his hand. That's a human purpose. That's a human understanding. His perspective needed to change to a kingdom mindset. What is in your hand is more than just your means of survival. It's more than just your means of livelihood. God transforms Moses' perspective of the staff from a means to fulfill his job and just his livelihood to a weapon of eternal kingdom purpose. This is the same staff that Moses parts the Red Sea with. This is the same staff that he strikes the rock with to give the entire nation of Israel water to drink. The perspective of what we have needs to change. I sometimes ask that question, that when, when the staff turned to a snake, 
surely Moses dealt with snakes every day in the wilderness. <laughs> I mean, s- snakes away from the... But I think when the staff was no longer in his hand, and in the hand of God, his perspective changed. I now need to trust. I can't trust this thing anymore. I trust the God behind the weapon. Pick that snake up by the tail. The lesson of that, why he ran, was in the transformation, not the snake. He was being transformed into who God needed him to be. And God used the staff. The perspective change for Moses was in his transformation to a kingdom mindset. Not a how can I satisfy me. That God would choose us. That God would use my offering. A mere staff, a mere whatever it may be. Needs to change our perspective. Because it changed an entire nation. God can use whatever it is in your hand to right size you and right size the kingdom story that He calls each one of us to. The purpose of this, this staff transformed Moses' perspective. Thirdly, the last lesson. That which is in our hands, God uses to reveal what holds your heart. It mirrors for us what is on the throne of our hearts. What sits on your throne? Is it what's in your hand? God knows that nothing shows our trust in Him more than the joy and gratitude of contributing to what he is doing. It's about equal sacrifice, not about equal giving. For Moses, it was a staff, an insignificant stick, we think. Equal sacrifice, not equal giving. 10% is regarded as the principle represented in Scripture. But that's not the point. The point is the shift in the way we view that discipline needs to be the same way we view other disciplines. Let me explain that to you. So, people will ask me, does our tithe need to to be gross or net income? It's always gross. No, I'm, oh, that, that was a joke. I'm just kidding. That is the wrong way to look at it. We need to shift our heart behind that, behind the giving from an Old Testament perspective and understanding to a New Testament understanding. What do I mean by that? Everybody, if everybody just gave with their heart, with a New Testament perspective, which I'm going to explain now, the Lord would be in control of everybody's sacrifice. Hear me? And we would need, wouldn't need to stand up here and ask people for a parking fund. Do you know how hard that is from this side of the perspective? In an economy that we're busy with, do you know how hard the trust is and the faith is to stand up here and, and do this. Everybody goes, oh, they're asking for money again. But this, have, have you ever put yourself up here? We wouldn't need to do that if our hearts were aligned with God in every aspect of our lives. We have never had to do a building campaign or a capital campaign since I've been here. And God has come through every single time. So that's a testimony for you. We have done some big things around here. We have changed a lot. 
And the elders said, maybe we need to shift our thinking to a capital campaign. And I turned to them, I said, I've never done one and I'm never going to do one. Not because we shouldn't or we, it's not that, that's not the principle. For me, it's about if people's hearts understand the principle of giving, God will do the work. We lay before the congregation, God's people, what is on God's heart. That's my job. That's my faith step. The faith step then rests, what is God going to do with you? That's the point of Moses here. God is training him to say to the nation, trust me. God has said, and if it's not of God, that's not on you, that's on me. That's on Moses. You've placed Deline and I in this pulpit. You placed us here. And we're not gonna, I'm not going to stand up here and be like, right, send the envelopes out. No, I'm leaving that with you and God. This is, you know what our needs are. And it's not about a once-off, it's about a heart perspective. We've never had to, and I'm not about to start now. God places the steps. We lay those steps before God and say, right, you said it. <laughs> you do it. If everybody gave their equal sacrifice of their heart before God, and were, were obedient when God compelled them to give, it would be sufficient, wouldn't it? So the onus then doesn't sit with me. That makes, it makes sense. In the Old Testament, the concept of tithings and offerings was wrapped up in rules and regulations. I almost feel like it was wrapped up in a building campaign. Can I, I don't know if that's right to say. I'll probably get shouted at later, but that's okay. It's not based on rules and regulations. You bring your first fruits because that is what is demanded of you. It's the grain offering, it's the atonement offerings, it's the two pigeons and the, two, and the doves. Whatever you're giving at that time, it, it, that's it. If you didn't bring it, you deal with that. Certain amounts, certain types, and there was guilt attached to the offering. That is why Jesus was so clear when he went to the temples. It wasn't about the, them in the marketplace. It was about the people abusing God's offering, extorting God's people, raising the, the amounts in order to get the two pigeons, raising the amounts in order. There was so much guilt attached to offering. In the New Testament, we make the relational transformation, the relational transition in all our other disciplines. It's crazy. We pray not because we have to. We pray because we desire to walk in relationship with Jesus. We, we fast to seek the heart of God in decisions that we need. Nobody tells us to fast or commands us to fast. We read God's word. Why? Because we love Him and we want to know who Jesus is. When it comes to this thing of offering preachers put it in the guilt put it back in the law you will it's not an atonement it's not something you buy or earn God's favor with it's when people come to me and they go I'm, I'm making sure that you that you got my, my tithe this month, right? 
I'm like, what are you doing? I'm just making sure, like, you know, I've earned my favor with God. But it's rather a love worth sacrificing for. A kingdom perspective worth contributing to. No more guilt, no more specific rules to appease God. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Now that's a dangerous statement for a preacher to say. Because now you're going, oh, okay. That doesn't equate to what's in my heart. That was, that was rules-based. It's dangerous for me to stand up here and say that. But it continues, it says, Not reluctantly, reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a what? A cheerful giver. Somebody who is aligned with the heart of God and gives with a joyful heart. I'm going to say that. If you give reluctantly, stop giving. Stop giving. Because you're giving with the wrong heart. It's the mirror. That is how God deals with that. If you're giving reluctantly or out of compulsion, it's Old Testament. But when we give from a place of, man, it's a joy to contribute to what God is doing in this place. It's a joy to see the kingdom happening. The eight people that were baptized last week, the, the youth growing, they, when they come out, go out of this room, it feels like half the congregation's leaving. Those are kingdom things. Those are eternal things. It's a kingdom perspective. I give with joy, not out of compulsion. And it's, it's equal sacrifice, not equal giving. For somebody, a hundred rand out of a thousand rand that they earn in a month is a lot of money. For some of us, a hundred thousand rand means nothing. Who's us? Put your head. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's not about the, it's not about the, the gift, it's about the heart. Equal sacrifice. Dare I say the other flip side, now that I've sold the church down the river, the, the other flip side of that is sometimes a hundred thousand rand isn't a sacrifice. Please, if you're that person. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? Then you need to question your heart on the other side of the coin. Who, God, I still can do this without having to trust you. Hmm, that's a tough one. For Moses, it was laying down his livelihood, seeing the transformation of God, using him, using that staff, using his offering for God's purposes, for God's plans. I think God, Moses must have looked back on this moment when God says, raise your staff and part the Red Sea. God, why didn't I trust you there? Like, this makes sense now. Kingdom perspective. Heart transformation. The mirror comes up. What do you do with the mirror? I'm telling you, stop giving and look at the man in the mirror. Or the woman in the mirror. Ask the question, what is in my hand? If you knew, I'm sorry. I really am. This is very hard for me. First time in five and a half years. But this is what it is about. Our giving to this home should be an appropriate sacrifice for us that is done with a joyful heart. Not reluctantly. If you call this place home, the mirror is your space this week. Because then we need to check the condition of our hearts. Do not do it begrudgingly. It's a kingdom perspective. God is doing something. What do I have? 
Don't feel like it's insignificant, but also don't feel like it's not worth anything, that you don't need to do it. Everything is revolved around the relationship and the transformation of our hearts. It's not a rule. It's not a regulation. Sometimes I wish regarding this, it would be. (laughs) You want to get into heaven? Why are you laughing this side? (laughs) So let's join God on what He's doing. The staff of Moses was merely a representation of his life. What is in your hand that represents your life? Being people who understand joy, who understand an offering with a kingdom story. Let's pray. So Lord God, may we repent of what we have made our disciplines. May we repent of our hearts that are not pure before you. Deal with our joy. that we may see you at work and that we may join you in what you are doing and be obedient. So I thank thank you for these people in front of me, your people that you've placed in this place for this season, for this time, to do what you have called us to do in this place for this season, for this time. May we be obedient to what you have called us to be. May we be the staff that you need. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.